So welcome to my backyard, and here I'm showing you a little maquette of uh, Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones. We're going to try and carve that today, but we're going to start by taking off two rings of, of uh, plastic. Uh, technically, it's HDPE, uh, three millimeter, and uh, each sheet is two feet by eight feet. I uh, filled this yesterday with some snow that was about three days old. It, when it was initially fluffy snow and then it became packing as uh, it really warmed up. So this has been sintering uh, overnight and uh, the camera is currently in my house shooting through a window so I apologize for a bit of the reflection you're seeing there but I think you'll still get an idea of what's happening here. So I, I had some fluffy stuff on top just so that it wouldn't have a crusty top on it and now I'm going to use a long serrated saw to, uh, to start the initial uh, initial cuts and there I'm cutting the V for where <clears throat> Mick's hair will be and uh, I'll mention that uh, this video is uh, originally about 84 minutes long and uh, it's been double speeded so it's a two times speed which will speed things up uh, I just used a big saw there you can see big, just a big hand saw to do some of the big shapes boy when you first start you're really chunking off some some uh, some big chunks of snow so I've got the maquette that I made in my left hand, and that's plastilina that I get at Michael's. And it helps me get the proportions right. Now you'll notice that <clears throat> as I cut, I'm looking at it from different angles, and that is so key. Um, overall, the setup for this wasn't quite perfect because it was good for the camera angle, uh, but it's uh, tough for me to stand back 10 feet, and I find standing back 10 feet really gives me a good perspective on where things should be positioned. So I'm working here at a bit of a disadvantage, but we're gonna give it a try as I start with some of the hairline here and just trying to rough in some of the, the, main, the main things. So the snow is flying off. You can see that it's quite carvable. Later I'll find that there's a couple of ice chunks here and there. And that's uh, because of the packing snow nature. Sometimes the, the snow becomes uh, ice-like. Um, Non-packing snow is by far the best for carving because you get such a beautiful, consistent carve. Now, this knife here is a long, serrated knife. And notice it's thin. And the thin adds a, a functionality that is really helpful. It's a very thin saw which allows for quick turns of the saw, which gives you more options. So here I'm starting to rough out some of the sides. <clears throat> and I just stuck it in Mick's head. I should apologize for that. And now I'm working on the side view. So <clears throat> initial cuts involve trying to get the outside shapes. And so if you stand at the front, you'll get the two sides. And if you stand at the side, you'll get that all-important front shape. Now, right off the bat, some of these cuts are so key because if you get the nose in the wrong position, then you might have trouble. You want to take off lots, but you don't want to obviously go too deep because this is pretty well a subtractive art form. We're taking snow off. Now, later you'll notice that I actually will push snow onto the nose because, <clears throat> as it turns out, I did take off a little bit too much on the nose. So keep that in mind. And later you'll see me grab some, some snow that, uh, that fell to the ground and I grab a, a clump of it and push it onto the nose and then I'll hold it there for some time. And then I'll let it center while I carve other parts of the carving. <clears throat> so here I go with the eyes, it looks like. I'm starting to uh, shape out the eyes. So the position down from the top is key, obviously. And uh, some of my initial cuts, oh, there's the nose. My initial cuts in those eyes involve digging right in next to the nose. And you'd be surprised how deep you need to go to uh, have any chance of, of uh, making it realistic. So here I'm taking another look. Some key cuts here. There we go. Always thinking of what tool should I be using? <clears throat> starting to shape on the sides of the nose here and uh, I'd say you spend uh, probably 
close to half the time just looking at the sculpture and planning where should I cut because once you commit to a key cut man it's done another time uh, it's funny when I first built this tower I realized man I should have put this on my rotator because I do have a rotator that would allow me to spin this around so if I ever do another large larger sculpture like this for the video I'll put it on a rotator so that I can spin it around and which I think will provide uh, additional learning opportunities I'm doing a voiceover right now <clears throat> because uh, doing the the talking while carving would certainly take some mental energy and that allows me to focus on the actual carving uh, it would also be uh, very hard on the uh, the batteries outside that would run the microphone because this was a very cold day of carving so the camera's inside where it's nice and warm and the camera won't freeze up which is quite helpful oh there i am i'm looking at the side now thinking what am i going to do next what's needed so then I attack the next section as I've registered in my mind what needs to come off. The small tool I'm using here is a grapefruit knife. And uh, it's serrated on both sides. It has a small bend. And uh, it's great for carving in both directions. Now, if you get really exacting, a grapefruit knife can have a very fine point or sort of rounded. And I've got both, but I do find that the pointed one is a little better. Now here I'm working, I think I'm working under the nose here. Oh, I'm sitting because it does get tiring. And I'm starting to think of below the nose and I'm already realizing that the, uh, the front of that nose is a little too high. I'm already realizing that I may have to do something here. But I'm starting to carve from the center of the nose down into, uh, into the hollows on the right and left. And again, I find, or uh, it was a, a revelation to me, how far back you have to swoop back into the face to get that uh, the angles right just above the lips. Oh, and there, I switched to the top again. As I reflect on my carving, I do notice that I, I sometimes work on one area and then all of a sudden I'll switch to another. And I would guess that as you make one piece closer to what your goal is, uh, another part of the sculpture will pop out as wrong. And so you're just drawn to try and bring that closer to what you really need. <clears throat> now, the eyes are obviously very tricky. There I am digging in a little deeper around the nose. And uh, if I, <clears throat> again, if I get good and deep in next to the nose in that eye socket, that's going to help me uh, have success. There, I'm back to the mouth again. Working away in the cold. I'm seated right now. My eye level is a little high. Oh, it's okay. I, I like to be level with where I'm carving. So if this was perfect, as I work on the mouth, I should pr probably get lower so I can really get that perspective. Perspective is, is like the whole thing, I find. It's so key. <clears throat> Standing back 10 feet, if you can. Thinking about what the shapes are. Holding your maquette in your left hand and having that visual reference makes it so much easier to get it closer to what you need. Here I'm doing some real detail work on the eyes. And eyes are, I'd say, the trickiest. It's detailed work. Uh, you have to think about how to clean out the snow that you're carving. Um, I have made a, a decision through this carve. I've realized that I need to change my uh, carving approach a little bit. When I carve something like eyes, I would often carve a little bit out and, and then the fluffy snow would be just sitting there and I'd blow it out with a burst of air from my mouth. And that would blow away the snow, which would be great. But I'm now noticing that the moisture that hits the sculpture when I blow out uh, basically forms a bit of an icy coating on where I've just carved. And then if I go carve somewhere else and come back, Meanwhile, that moisture has frozen to ice and it makes subsequent detail work in that area more difficult. So in future, I'm going to try not to uh, breathe moist air, uh, which means I'll need a new solution. Maybe that'll just be uh, more carefully removing the snow with the tool that I'm using. 
Ah, here I come with the nose. I mentioned earlier that I'd have to hold some snow on. Now notice that uh, this is again double speed. <laughs> I shake them just. For, I just. I think I just noticed that he moved, so uh, I shook it a bit. <clears throat> and I was a little surprised how light the whole thing was. Anyways, you saw me hold the snow on there, and and uh, I'm now letting that center while I work on other areas of the sculpture. So that uh, when I come back to the nose, hopefully. Uh, it won't just fall apart. <clears throat> I usually get too excited though about uh, the new area that I've just thrown snow on, and you'll notice I'll get I'll back, get back onto that nose pretty quickly. And I guess it, it's sort of a test. Uh, and you're always testing to see what is the makeup of this uh, snow, the consistency. And you'll see me in a moment start carving that nose. And it's basically if it holds together, then you know keep going. And uh, because as soon as you can get off those big chunks and get it closer to your target, the, uh, the easier it's going to be to, to uh, see what is required next. There I've moved to some removal of a lot of material or a lot of snow. Oh, there's my hand. The hand is a wonderful tool. That's something my father used to tell me. And especially in snow sculpting, if you rub a, a large area with your glove or mitten, uh, it's, it ends, acts like a, sand, a sanding uh, action. It really smooths things out and again helps you get more close to uh, or closer to what you're after. Oh, there's the detail in the nose I'm working on. Noses are, uh, can be a challenge, uh, but again, looking at a maquette makes it so much easier. Now, what if you don't have a maquette? Well, if you want to get serious about snow sculpting, uh, I think a maquette is the way to go. Uh, I can buy a chunk at Michael's for about $5. I always use my 30% off coupon or even 40% off, and, and it ends up being about $4. And this chunk of uh, plasticine in my hand here, it might be one chunk, it might be two, so less than $10. And uh, then in the evening, sometimes if, if I'm watching a TV program or something, I'll just work away on my maquette. And the, it helps to uh, figure out what the angles are. And not only does it give you a visual reference to hold as you're carving real snow, but as you do the maquette, you're really wrestling with some of the shapes. Like Mick Jagger has some very interesting lines on, within his cheeks and uh, the way his eyes are angled. And if you can wrestle with those ideas with the maquette, uh, then you're halfway there. So it looks like I'm focusing on some of the upper parts at the moment, again with my long saw. <clears throat> I have other videos on my website, uh, in YouTube, Matt DJ Morris, that review some of the tool options that uh, might make life easier for you. I'm using a fairly limited group here. I'll be adding in loop tools momentarily because loop tools are very reasonable in price and uh, can really add some some helpful um, operations in the carving. Oh, here I'm really thinking about what's that hairline and how am I going to work in that ear? When I first started carving, I would always ignore ears, but let's face it, ears help bring the uh, sculpture to life and. Uh, we're going to try and get some ears going for Mick. Studying again. I can't stand back 10 feet. That's the problem. So I'm trying my best to get an idea of what are the angles we really need here. And here I'm noticing that his hair kind of swooped a little bit down on both sides after that initial rise near the uh, part. And it's funny how you know, you'll change something like that and all of a sudden you'll say, well, I think that's getting closer. You can just all of a sudden see it appearing. Here I'm getting the other side um, dealt with so that my two sides will be uh, closer to what I'm after. Mick is now sitting up top. And I think I'm going to leave him up there for a little while so I can glance at him and yet keep carving. Okay, what's next? Cutting off lots of material on the side there and doing a little bit of detail on the ear, I believe. Adjust the seating. Deal with
with a cold hand. I've taken the mid off, and this always happens for snow sculptors. For fine work, and here we're working on eyes, for fine work, definitely uh, the gloves come off. Uh, I've got so many layers on here, though, that I'm, I'm quite warm. I've got good warm boots on and lots of layers of wool and a beautiful wool hat that my wife, Lorna, knit for me. Thank you, Lorna. And so I'm pretty toasty, so it's, it's not really hard on the hands at this point. Working on the all-important eyes. If you don't get the eyes right, it's never going to look as it should. Now, Mick Jagger singing is a very uh, dramatic facial expression. So that'll take some, some doing to try and get that right. Now I'm, I'm making this voiceover on my iPhone. And the interesting uh, way the software is set up is that the uh, recording symbol covers half of my drawing. So from the upper lip down, I can't really see, but I can, I can sort of tell I'm carving the upper lip here. And angles on lips are pretty key, obviously. Oh, there's that nose detail coming. When you cut the nostrils, especially with newly sintered snow, you have to be very careful you don't burst off a whole chunk. So a very small hole that is then reamed out slowly is a way to go because then the snow releases into the hole you've already created. There we go, jumping up to the top again. Give, give myself a little more definition on where the hair meets the skull. There's my hand smoothing things off. You know, this is a day later. Well, I'm looking at that hair, and perhaps later in the video I'll cut off more. But the top right there, that looks like that needs to be cut off. And again, just like standing back 10 feet, looking at a sculpture a day later, you sometimes have a whole fresh perspective and get new ideas of what needs to be worked on. I've uh, many times gone back at a sculpture a day or even two or three days later. Oh, there's a loop tool. Uh, and, uh, and adjusted things. Now, this loop tool has a very sharp angle. And I'm using it to uh, cut some, some deep lines in Mick's face. And I've got a variety of loop tools. <clears throat> here, I'm back to the grapefruit knife, I think. And what am I doing here? Am I holding on some more snow? I think I'm holding on a little more snow. Again, double speed. But I didn't hold that on very long, did I? I think I could have held it on a little more. So now I'm getting serious about the eyes. And uh, changing the angle just to get the angle right. Remember, there's a bend in this knife. So the approach can be altered. And you might get the angle you need by flipping the knife over. Sometimes you need to lean back. There you go. And take a look to decide what's next. The angle on his brow is so key to get it close to what he is. He's got little anger marks there. The lines above his nose. And then, as I've just used that loop tool with the hard angle, I guess my brain has registered that <clears throat> I can use it for the hair. And so, I decide, I, I guess what I really, oh, there I blew. So that's going to create some moisture and perhaps uh, icy surface on his hair. But um, I think in some ways I'm taking a break from carving here and doing something that needs to be done. A very simple task of cutting <clears throat> hair lines in the hair. And it's uh, fairly routine work. Sorry for blocking your view there. Uh, but what happens here is it gives my mind a break from the, from the thought process of carving. But it also uh, gets a bit closer to what he's supposed to look like. And that might help in itself in, in the rest of the carving. 
Also, I'll come back with a fresh perspective once I'm done the hair. And that new perspective might help me catch something on the uh, core part of the carving. So here I'm doing a little more hair further back <clears throat> to extend that break and to uh, perhaps make it look more, uh, more finished in the hair. So Okay, so now with a new perspective and uh, the hair showing a little better, it's back to that eye. And I'm focusing on the right eye and again blowing. Now it's really bothering now seeing myself blow that moist air. I've got to find a better way. Now, on the eye, the very center of the eye is the uh, closest to me, but on the two sides where they go into the corners, they go quite a bit deeper. The eyeball is not straight, straight across. Now, you knew that. An eyeball is a ball. It's a sphere. But when you carve it, you have to remember that and think. The two corners are moving back in that sphere, and they should be much deeper than the uh, front. So now that the eyes are getting a little closer, now I'm noticing that the nose is really off. And I should be taking a look at the maquette again to see what am I missing. There's, I'm taking a look. What am I missing on the edge of that nose? And by studying that maquette, you often will unlock it. You'll, uh, you'll, you'll pretty well, you will know when you look at the nose and it's wrong, it just won't feel right. You might even feel frustration. I felt frustration. But then you study your maquette. That's where the hard work has been done. That's, that was your investment. And you look at that nose and all of a sudden you realize, ah, that's what I need to do. And so you apply that to the carving. And then the carving starts to look more as it should. And that's, that's a cool moment. Very satisfying for a sculptor. It's a beautiful day. This is Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. And I think it was minus 13 Celsius. I'm in the shade here, although I have a bit of sun on my face there. Uh, but just a gorgeous, gorgeous day and a great day for carving. A little sanding over the top, sanding on the nose. I usually use the back side of my mitten because on the mitt, uh, our gloves because on these gloves, the backside has some smooth spots which are good for, for the sanding process. Um, depending on what kind of glove you have, um, you may have a seam on it that digs lines into your snow and so that's a, that's a no-no. I used to have a pair of thin gloves which were totally seamless and they were great until I realized that they were so thin, the heat from my hand was uh, melting the snow a little bit and again giving me a, a more uh, icy surface. And so I have moved back to the back of my big glove here. Now, here I'm working on the lip line and teeth. And uh, I may have taken off too much snow initially on these teeth, but getting the mouth just right for Mick was a real challenge. And again, looking at the maquette to see how do I, how do I carve off the angles of those lips so they uh, they look more realistic there I'm studying looking at proportions interesting that this this late into the carve I'm still carving some big lines as I've discovered that the angle on the on the cheeks is not where I want it to be And if I can cut out some big chunks down by the ears there, that'll get me closer to uh, what we want. <clears throat> Here's where having it on a rotator would have been a good idea. It's, that's going to be fun to eventually uh, do a, a demo on a big rotator. That, that'll be fun. But, you know, ultimately, if something goes wrong, how much have I spent here? Basically nothing other than the, the initial small investment in some simple tools. Um, the snow is free, and it's large, and it's wonderful. There's nothing to store when you're done. Take a few pictures to remember what you've done. Learn some new skills. And if something goes wrong, you can push snow on. 
I have a separate video on how to make uh, patch snow where you mix a little bit of water and there's a couple of key tricks. Uh, so I've just been pushing snow on here today for that nose. But you can actually, there's a slightly better way of uh, using patch snow. And uh, a gentleman named Peter Vogelaire, a very uh, famous snow carver, taught me that one time at a, at a, uh, at a snow sculpting competition that he was involved with. And there's a separate video that you can watch on how to make patch snow. Here I'm working on that curve. So looking at that side view, it's quite, it's an easy process to get the curve on the nose right if you look at the side view and you have a good maquette. Now if you don't have a maquette, so I know some of you won't, won't do that, but you could take two pictures. Take a front view and a side view. Uh, sometimes a side view of a person you're trying to carve is difficult to find. So in this case, I would type Mick Jagger side view. And uh, well, that might be my wife's reflection in the glass there. Hello, Lorna. <laughs> Anyways, back to pictures. Uh, front view, side view can accomplish many of the same things as a maquette. And if you can great get a great view of, for example, the nose, they can make a dramatic cut and make it closer to what you need. Now, I've run off for some reason. I may cut this out, but maybe, oh, there I'm back. And what do I have here? I brought out something. Oh, eyes, yes. I've brought out some eyes to see if an eye would be appropriate. Now, um, eyes can really make a sculpture pop, but that one's way too big, <laughs> for example. And if you don't get the perfect eye, I think that's too small. If you don't get the perfect eye, it just looks silly. So I went through a process here of checking eyes, and now these eyes are not really eyes, they're irises, only the colored part. I turn them on my lathe, and then I sand them down so they fit properly into the, uh, into the desired sculpture, and I paint them and put some gloss on them. But I think I've determined on this sculpture that I do not have an eye that would do justice to Mick Jagger. I uh, once did a sculpture of uh, Albert Einstein and I uh, put the wrong colored eyes into the sculpture and uh, Reddit have some, had some fun with me as people complained. So I quickly went out the next day and changed the eye color. You can see that in my, uh, if you look back on my different seasons on my website, you can actually see the whole story about the carving of Albert Einstein. I carved him uh, much more accurately years later at the Perimeter Institute, uh, Physics Institute in Waterloo. And that was, that was a lot of fun. I certainly got the eye color right for that one. So I'm adjusting my seating here. It looks like I want to focus in on eyes, on the left eye now. Getting the curve right. Now as you move to the outside, again it swoops way back, more than you'd think. It's not just straight across. And there I'm, I'm trying to get the uh, lines under the eye there. I think I'm doing tool selection here. I'm looking for a very specific tool, a very small loop tool. Here it comes. I think I'll show it to you. It's got two sides. And this is for some real detail work. And here I'm trying to get into the corners of the eyes. And uh, this was sort of a decision on the fly. I hadn't used this tool in a while, but <clears throat> I realized that I, I, I needed to get some real detail work uh, some real fine work and uh, this small loop tool became the ticket. Now <clears throat> for some reason I'm also blowing uh, on the eyeball. There you go. And uh, it's certainly clearing away the snow but again it's adding that moisture which is going to cost me later. sanding across the top there <clears throat> lots of detail on the eye this is such a fun hobby for me and it's been so much fun sharing 
what I've learned with, uh, with people. And if you're watching this, I'm guessing you're becoming pretty hardcore. And uh, hopefully you can get out there yourself and, and uh, have some fun with this. You know, I can't understate the importance of the initial tower. Way back, you'll notice here, I had two, two rings of plastic, but it doesn't, you don't have to go run out and buy 3mm HDPE. You can just find some old scrap plywood. That's how I started. Or other containers. Um, if you want to do something this size on the cheap, I would say keep your eye open in the garbage for uh, scrap plywood. Make sure it's safe. Make sure there's no nails and screws and things in it that might hurt you. And then uh, throw something together and, and hold it together with some ratchet straps or even rope. And then shovel in the snow. Pound it in. I have lots of other videos on that process. And let it center that wonderful word. And then once you take off the forms, then you're presented with this beautiful carvable medium of snow. And that's where the fun begins. And uh, I think that uh, if you think of the big s snow sculpting competitions where they're carving blocks that are 10 feet by 10 feet by 12 feet, like it's incredible. And I, I don't think the people that build those massive blocks of beautiful snow get credit enough. So here's a shout out to all the people that build the big blocks of snow. <clears throat> and here I am carving away. When I'm shoveling and building that block of snow, I don't have to dress that warmly because it's a real workout. Um, but once I'm carving here, this is when you put on all the layers you can because you're, it's not a physically uh, challenging activity. You're, you're sitting around, moving around a little bit, but not like you're shoveling and packing snow. So dressing warmly is absolutely critical to have fun. What am I working on here? A little bit more of the mouth. A little, I'm thinking here. Thinking, what's missing? Here I'm blocking your view. Oh, I'm back to the eye again. Something must have caught my eye. <laughs> okay, back to the mouth. I think I'm on teeth here. Very gentle, very gentle cuts. Notice how the knife is entering the snow. Very, very gentle cuts. Now, what's next? Oh, I'm using a, a soft sanding block to do some final sanding. It's very flexible because the danger is that the edge of this block cuts in and carves a line. So this one's very flexible. I think I got it at the dollar store or something. It just puts a bit of a smoothness on the whole thing. Now, I don't think I'm done here, but... I thought if I sand it at this point, because I'm close to the end, it'll get me a better view. It'll provide me a better view of, of what my next target might be. And, uh, you know, towards the end of this, we're getting to some finer adjustments, and those fine adjustments can make or break uh, the sculpture. And uh, even though I've been moving fairly quickly here, and... Uh, I am affected by the fact that I'm being videoed. If I was not videoing this, I think I might be working a little slower. I think it's the uh, performance anxiety or something or not wanting to take too long that might be pushing me quicker than would be perfect. But it is what it is, and here's the video. But my point being, towards the end of a carving, that's, I think, where even more thought comes in. Look at me looking at my maquette. I'm saying... What are the little minor cuts that will make the difference between good and great? It takes a lot of thought. And at this stage, I would recommend thinking more than carving. There, taking off some cheek. This late in the cycle, I'm still taking off a little bit of a cheek. These loop tools have a serrated or a slightly serrated side 
and a smooth side. And I generally use the slightly serrated side. Thinking, cutting. And you know, <clears throat> here's another idea. At some point, if you're carving a long time, go inside, have a hot chocolate, take a break, go to the washroom, <laughs> eat something, and then come back. Because again, giving yourself the opportunity to have a new perspective or a fresh perspective can catch some things. I sometimes take a picture of what I've carved and put it beside a picture of my maquette. And that in itself gives me a wonderful comparison of the A and the B. And sometimes I'm surprised almost every time something jumps out at me that needs work. Now, I've been talking about creating Mick Jagger here, but and that's good and fun, but it doesn't have to be someone. It can just be someone you've created. In which case you're much more free to to just create and you're you'll be creating a unique a unique carving. Why not? Boy, some late angles on the left and right of the nose there. And then just right there. Just those fine cuts on the edge of the nose. Becomes so key, a little sanding there to see to, to help me ask, am I done? Am I have I got it? Take a look, think. Oh, and I'm bringing out the big knife. So obviously I've realized something again that's not quite right about the bottom, uh, the chin angles. Look at that, big cuts. Thinking. Now I've been doing a lot of looking from the front. I should probably get over on the side there sometime and look at the uh, the other axis for a new perspective. Some carvers I know put headphones on. And I think there's maybe two purposes for that. One is that uh, it helps you just get into the groove and uh, makes it very enjoyable. The other one might be that uh, it allows you to focus on the work and not have to uh, uh, interact with your audience uh, because it certainly takes uh, mental energy to interact. And uh, I've had great discussions with, with some pro carvers and they've been very generous with their time and I thank them. But I totally understand also when sometimes they're just working on something, often a very technical piece, where they just need to focus. So it's fun to just watch them work sometimes. Lots of thinking. Less carving, more thinking at this stage. My uh, bottom teeth, I took out too much material, too much snow. Um, I could have had a better uh, line of bottom teeth uh, and the tongue, obviously, from Mick Jagger, very key. Uh, I guess I could have pushed snow in there, but I think I was done. Um, do notice on those teeth, though, that they don't go straight across. They totally curve back into the head, which sounds pretty darn obvious. But, oh, there he's singing. So apparently I'm going to shake him now as if he's singing a, singing a song. <laughs> Clean up the tools. Yeah, the teeth, just to finish that off, really curve back into the head. And um, once you figure that out, as I did way back in, I think, season two, uh, that was a breakthrough for me. And it might be a breakthrough for you as you carve those teeth swooping right back into the head. So here I'm just final cleanup. It looks like I'm done for now. And uh, I'm trying to lift him up, but he's too heavy. So there he is. He's moving. He's singing. Oh, there's a different angle for you. 
Wow. <laughs> that was good fun. Thanks for watching, everybody. I uh, hope you have lots of fun out there this winter with your experiments.